Okay, we're starting like the end of the class. Uh, we're going to work on something uh, related to kinetic molecular theory at first and see how solids and liquids uh, behave under that kind of a theory and in reality. And then later we're going to do uh, some organic chemistry. I personally think that this unit is what makes chemistry really interesting and how you can put together whether you ever do any more chemistry at all or not, kind of how things work chemically. Uh, but let's start again with uh, the overview of how gases work, which we did uh, in Unit 6. Okay, so um, we're talking about how gases work compared to liquids and solids. So we know that gas volume can be changed a lot with pressure. We can make, we can increase pressure that de decreases the volume, for example. So increase pressure, decrease volume. But at any rate, that change can be really significant. But solids and liquids volumes, they don't change a lot whenever you in, uh, change the pressure. I mean, they, they may change some, but not nearly like the significant change you'd see in gases. Uh, we also know that gas volume changes a lot with temperature, in fact. Under the kinetic molecular theory, uh, the kinetic energy of, or the average kinetic energy of any sample is totally dependent on the temperature. Uh, and so we know that they can, the volume will increase if we increase the temperature and it would decrease if we decrease the temperature. Uh, a volume change for solids and liquids is much, much smaller. We know gases flow very freely and they mix together pretty easily too. And we also know that gases have very low density somewhere measured typically in grams per liter compared to solids and liquids, which would be grams per centimeter cubed, and a liquid is grams per mil. So we know there's some significant differences in the way gases behave compared to solids and liquids. And so, some of those things we saw early on. So, we'll start with gases down here. And remember that they are far apart. They don't have attractions to each other. The only time they actually interact is when they collide. Uh, they take up the entire space of whatever the, the volume or the container is. Uh, they can rotate. They these molecules, they translate. Oh, translation means that the molecules move past each other, so this guy could just as easily move that way without having any interaction with the other gas molecule. And um, they also vibrate. Likewise, liquids do all of these same motions, but they're not as uh, energetic as the liquid is held in some kind of a volume. It doesn't really have a whole lot of ups or downs from that volume, and the molecules are very close together. And then solids, of course, only thing they can do in their solid state is vibrate. All right, they vibrate all the time, but all these solid molecules can, can do is just vibrate between themselves. So they don't really do any translation or vibrations. <clears throat> Now, under the kinetic molecular theory, we assumed or said that they have no attractive, these are gases, ideal gases, no attractive or repulsive forces. But we know that's not really true in reality, all right? Uh, we can add enough pressure or lower the temperature enough that we can form liquids and gases. Uh, I mean, liquids and solids from those. And that's because of, well, the temperature has something to do with it, but we're going to start looking at something called intermolecular forces, which I will abbreviate as IMF because I'm a lazy chemist and I don't want to write out on intermolecular forces every time. So this is the gas. Here's an ideal gas. In this case, the particles are so far apart that they have no interaction and we're good with the ideal gas. But remember, we also talked about how real gases behave uh, 
And if you increase the pressure on a real gas, that causes these gas particles to be very close together. And in fact, when they're close together, there are attractive and repulsive forces between these gas molecules. Now, we're mostly going to focus on attractions, but there's also a repulsions. At any rate, as they get closer and closer and begin to exhibit more and more pressure, I mean, more and more uh, interaction together, then you see uh, how gases can change into other phases. So, I just want to remind you that we've actually looked at this before when we were working on bond energy. So you'll remember that we did a heat diagram where this is heat and this is temperature. And I'm going to use Cl2 here as an example that has a boiling point of, I'm sorry, a melting point of minus 100 degrees Celsius and a boiling point of minus 34.4 degrees for its boiling point. And so if I was working on one of those enthalpy problems, let's assume I start down here at, say, minus 200. Well, that means that those particles in the chlorine are, first of all, they're going to be a solid because of the melting point. We'll look at that in just a minute. And that means they only can vibrate. All right, so if I take this to, say, minus 100, then as the temperature increases, those molecules begin to vibrate more and more and more. And then when they get to the melting point, you'll remember that the amount of heat continues to increase. Let me write this. This is a solid. The amount of heat continues to increase, but there's no change in the temperature. And we said that's because the potential forces, potential energy is being converted to kinetic energy. So potential energy here is going to kinetic energy, which means when those finally all melt, all of that chlorine at minus 100 degrees, then we have a liquid. And as we heat up our liquid to, say, minus 34 here, the liquid begins to rotate, and, uh, and sometimes it will translate and sometimes, uh, and of course, it still vibrates. And at minus 34 degrees, we begin to see things convert to uh, a gas. So at this particular place, again, we have no change in temperature, but the potential energy of the liquid is being converted to the kinetic energy in the gas. And then if at room temperature, at room temperature, so now, really not to scale, but let's assume now we're at uh, 273 Celsius, or I guess that's not quite room temperature, but at zero, uh, 273 at room temperature, sort of, uh, then we've got the chlorine in the gaseous space, which is how we see it in nature, because that's one atmosphere and uh, regular type of room temperature we're going to see chlorine gas in a gaseous, or chlorine in a gaseous space. So we've seen this type of work before. Now we're going to change uh, this over to something called a phase diagram, where we're going to look at this in a slightly different way. Okay, so phase diagrams can be drawn for anything. Uh, this particular one is for carbon dioxide, but it doesn't matter what the substance is. They would all exhibit the same kind of properties. So it's important for you to be able to identify things on this phase diagram. So first, let's start with what the axes are. This is temperature, okay, in degrees Celsius, and it's increasing. Down here, we have something at like minus 78 degrees Celsius, and up here is 31. And we have increasing pressure. Okay, so here's one atmosphere, and maybe this is two atmospheres, et cetera. So, at a particular temperature and pressure, you can figure out what kind of phase you have. All right, so in this, in this um, let's see, these boundaries 
help you identify the phase. So this is a solid. This one's gas down here. And then this is a liquid in this space. So you should always be able to figure out, given a pressure and temperature, what, um, what phase you are at. Now what are all of these lines? All of these lines are equilibria. All right, those are the places where you, at some particular pressure, you know what the temperature would be at this point along here for this carbon dioxide to melt and freeze. So we call that, when we were doing enthalpy, we talked about that as fusion, and then the opposite process is freezing. Along this particular line, right here, there is both solid and liquid in the mixture. And there's no temperature change while that phase change is happening. But right at this particular point, we can figure out the temperature at, say, two atmospheres. So we might call that, I don't know, minus 45, given this graph. <coughs> at any rate, so what about this line over here? This line is where there's both solid and gas, solid and gas, you see the gas extends way out here too, both solid and gas at equilibrium, which means that there, it, until it, the temperature is done, it's vaporizing and condensing at the same rate. And then there's another line down here through, up through here, let me just take some of this off for a minute so we can see what I'm talking about. This line right through here is a position where you have a solid and a gas in, in uh, equilibrium, all right? So at this particular point in time or in temperature and pressure, I have both solid and gas in my mixture. And that phase change, which we haven't looked at much, and we will in a, a little bit in a, little, in, a, in a few minutes, is called sublimation and deposition. Now there's some other signs, some other places on this graph that you should be aware of. And this one of them is the triple point. At the triple point, I know what temperature and pressure I need to have solid, liquid, and gas phases all at one time. So the triple point has the solid, liquid, and gas existing all at one time at that pressure and temperature. And then there's a place where you have something called the critical point. And this critical point is some, given the term supercritical fluid. After this temperature and pressure we get a supercritical fluid. And it's got properties of both uh, liquids and gases. And in fact, in this condition, at that point, the gas density is equal to the liquid density. Okay, so there's... <coughs> There's, it's an intermingling, and you can't really separate it out very well anymore. Now, supercritical, uh, the supercritical positions are used to do things like uh, decaffeinate coffee and so forth. Uh, and it's an interesting position. So you should be able to look at this phase diagram, which I've given you some copies of in your PowerPoint to help you find any position on that uh, phase diagram. Another thing you should be able to do is look at your phase diagram where I've given you some kind of temperatures and some kind of pressures. It should be an ATM, not an AM. Um, <clears throat> look at that graph and say, well, at some particular pressure and some particular temperature, I have some kind of a sol uh, some kind of a phase. So let's assume I have two atmospheres and 300 Kelvin. Well, let's do 250. So here's two atmospheres. I'll come over here. We'll say that's 250. So if I was trying to decide the phase, 
I'd say that's a liquid. All right, so <clears throat> another thing you should know that's a term that's important here. Here, I want to insert a blank page for a second. An impor important term and something you should know called the normal boiling point, the normal melting point. So in my phase diagram, okay, this is a solid, this is a liquid, and this is a gas. I want to know what the normal boiling point is and the normal melting point. Okay, so this has a special meaning, and that means at one atmosphere, one atmosphere, what is the boiling point or the melting point? So if I was asked that question, and presumably I'd give you some temperatures down here, but right now it doesn't matter, I would come over here. This is going to be the melting point. That's on that equilibria position. And so then I would decide, well, the normal melting point is at this temperature, whatever that temperature is. And if I wanted to know what the normal boiling point was, I'd bring my line over here based on one atmosphere because we consider that normal pressure. And this would be the normal boiling pressure, which I could then identify by looking down here and finding whatever those temperatures are. So you should be aware of uh, this phase diagram and how, how it works. And you should also know these terms. All right, so uh, phase changes have terms which we've mostly already learned, where fusion means you're going from a solid to a liquid, or it's melting. Freezing, you're going from a liquid to a solid. The temperature position is the same. The temp is the same. Another thing we learned way back when is that the delta H of fusion is equal to the negative delta H of freezing. So we also know that the amount of heat it takes either direction is the same. Uh, then, we, of course, we know vaporization. That's going from a liquid to a gas, while condensation is a gas to a liquid. Now, sublimation is something you might not be as familiar with, but in that case, you're going from a solid to a gas. So my mother-in-law sent me some Omaha steaks for, for uh, Christmas, and it was delivered in a box with car carbon, solid carbon dioxide in it to keep it cold until it got there. And so that CO2, as soon as I opened the box, it didn't melt. It didn't start turning into a liquid right away. It immediately started vaporizing into the air, which it had been doing on the mailing, but it just did it more quickly after I opened it. Uh, and the opposite process of that is a gas going to a solid. So if it's cold uh, at night and it didn't rain, but you might, but it's still very cold and there's moisture in the air, when you get up in the morning, you might have frost on your windshield. That's a deposition. The cold, humid air deposited onto your windshield from gas to solid. It never formed that liquid in the, in the intermediate state. And so I want to talk about these equilibria positions a little bit more, those lines that we were looking at on the phase diagram. Uh, we know phase changes are reversible. We can change the temperature uh, one way or the other to change the phases. Uh, we also know that we can use the pressure and the temperature to change the phase into one thing or another. And what we need to understand is that at equilibrium, okay, that's a term you'll look at much more if you go to Chem 2, but at equilibrium, the forward and the reverse reactions are occurring at the same rate, all right? So there's no net change in the rate. As soon as I form some liquid, I also form gas or whatever I'm changing to. And so on those phase diagrams that we just looked at, on the phase diagrams, we've seen that this is pressure and this is temperature, 
we can choose any pressure and temperature to figure out where we ought to see the melting point. So let's assume we have pressure of 1.5 atmospheres. We can estimate where that temperature should be. And it's at equilibrium, meaning the rate that it's freezing is the same rate that it's melting. All right. Then there's the solid gas equilibria, the sublimation and deposition position, uh, where we have a high pressure on this, <coughs> and we increase the, or if we decrease the pressure, then we end up getting instead of having solid CO2, we have uh, look, I mean gaseous CO2. Now I want to talk about this liquid gas equilibrium because we're going to think about this more, but I wanted to show you the process. Now this is a system, a closed system. That means the water bottle in your um, hand is closed if the lid's on it. That means the milk in your refrigerator is a closed system. That means the fingernail polish in your home is a closed system probably. Anyway. What happens is, after you remove, after you stopper this system up, okay, um, what happens is the liquid begins to vaporize, all right? So at first, some of this will vaporize out. When you reach equilibria, some is vaporizing out into the area that's closed off, and some is being uh, return to the liquid and at equilibria you have as many molecules coming out as you have going in or as at the same rate at any rate and so the gas enters and leaves at the same rate and there's some kind of pressure pressures is built up over that uh, pressure over the liquid that is what vapor pressure is all right, so after you close up whatever your system is, the vapors begin to first come out of the solution, and then eventually when they reach the right position, they go in and out at the same rate. All right, and so that's vapor pressure. And we'll look at that uh, a little bit more in the next couple of lessons as well. Now, I just wanted to bring up one more thing, and that has to do with the miraculous properties of water. This is the phase diagram that we just looked at, where we have mostly a positive type of slope on this solid to liquid formation. That compares to water, which has a slightly negative slope between solids and liquids. And what does that mean? That means the liquid, liquid is less dense than the solid. Why is that significant? That's significant because that way when, you know, we have frozen lakes, they're frozen on the top and not at the bottom. That means the ice stays on the top and doesn't drop to the bottom of the lake or the ocean or whatever we're talking about. Uh, and this is the, uh, allegedly, there's another one. I read somewhere there's another molecule that also does this unusual negative slope business. But water, and I, I never have been able to find it again since then, of course. But water is really unique in that it's almost the only thing that has this negative slope. And um, so you should be aware, uh, just because it is interesting in terms of how, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's interesting in terms of, of how the real world interacts. And thankfully, water properties give us great miraculous things that we that we otherwise wouldn't be a living earth without uh, and so kinetic molecular theory we're going to learn and we have learned that the physical state is influenced by the attractive forces 
we're focusing on attractive forces. There are repulsive forces too, but we're going to be focusing on attractive forces. They're influenced by attractive forces and kinetic energy. And the forces between the molecules determine things like the melting point, the boiling point, um, and other things like specific heat and so forth and so on. So uh, kinetic molecular theory explains a lot about how real solids, liquids, and gases work. Uh, and so in our next lesson, we're going to start looking at intermolecular forces. Really interesting. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do.